To stay up to date on all the voting rights and election news you need, click on the link above to subscribe to Democracy Docket's daily and weekly newsletters. Some think that because we got through one Trump presidency, we can survive another. Well, Molly Jong Fast is here to explain why a second Trump term would be a whole lot different. This is Defending Democracy, a weekly podcast from Democracy Docket. I'm Mark Elias. Welcome, Molly, to Defending Democracy. Thanks for having me. So, Molly, I got to begin with something you just wrote and published, which was like fortuitous for me <laughs> that you happen to have just written it and published it uh, as we were getting ready to record the podcast. Uh, and it is entitled Mike Johnson's House is Imploding. And I want to read one sentence from it, uh, two sentences from it, and sort of ask you to, to sort of explain a little further. You say, but the good news is about Johnson is that he's truly terrible at being speaker and his majority keeps shrinking. This is yet another case of American democracy being saved by Trumpist incompetence rather than institutional guardrails. And I'm just curious, you know, how do you how do you see that distinction between, you know, Republicans trying to do the right thing because there is this so such so-called governing wing of Republicans? And how much is it just Republican incompetence because they're just not very good? So you and I have like ta actually talked about this on television before, this idea that the guardrails, you know, one of the things that people in traditional media love to say is that the guardrails have held because at some points Trumpists have gotten caught up in the courts. But I actually have a theory of the case, which is the guardrails haven't held at all. And in fact, you know, the fact that maybe one case comes before the election but that the Republican nominee for president is facing 91 criminal counts and has only really been held up by these civil cases is, is really a sign that the guardrails, in fact, have not held and that this whole experiment is in way more jeopardy than we even think. And so what I think is very interesting about this MAGA house is that Trump is is not good at this, right? Like, thank God, he's not good at this, right? He's not, he's like lost every election since 2016. He's just not good at this. And so, uh, you know, he he had a speaker he wanted, he didn't want Tom Emmers. You know, there was like, a, there was about a month of like, here are the people who would be good speakers, right? Steve Scalise, Tom Emmers, you know, even Jim Jordan, who is by far one of the more disgusting Republican politicians, would have has some sort of skill though even he i mean i don't i don't want to say anything nice about him because he really is beyond the pale but uh but even he would have had some clue but instead they were like we really need only the most loyal to trump and you had to go down to like number five and you know when this is going on i was i was talking you know i have a lot of people uh democratic Congress people on my podcast all the time. And I was asking them about this guy. And I remember one of them being like, can you imagine if we made our number five, the speaker of the house? Like, <laughs> it's just such a crazy, idea, you know, so at every point Trump was, you know, Trump had this sort of one success and he could never get over it. And so, you know, which is the 2016 election. So at every point he thinks he's like this legislative genius. He thinks he's, you know, he keeps thinking, and because Republicans are so cowardly, they're like, yes, he is. He's a, you know, he can pick a speaker of the house. And, and so that is how we stumbled on Mike Johnson. Now, the good news, I think, for people like us is that he both is bad at this and also his views are very much not mainstream, even mainstream religious views. Like there's some sort of, you know, They're wild. even further than that. Yeah. They're wild, right? Wild. Wild. Yeah. I mean, Re Republican study committee times 20. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, I'm just curious, why is there so much energy, in your view, um, invested in this myth of the moderate Republican? Like, why, why does it have to be that there is this, uh, in, so, in the eyes of so many people, particularly in the mainstream media, that there is this kind of, like, faction of size and influence yeah. that yeah. actually is just in the Republican Party waiting on the precipice to save us. 
Yeah, I'm sort of guilty of this too. In fact, I was talking to Tim Miller about this the other day and I was saying, well, you know, maybe there's a world where Liz Cheney and Nikki Haley are waiting in the wings, keeping their powder dry for rebuilding the Republican Party. And he was like, I can't stop laughing. Uh, look, we want, you know, the idea that there's one party that still believes in democracy and one party that is completely embraced, uh, embraced authoritarianism is actually a terrifying idea, it is, right? Yeah. I mean, it's really scary because there's no precedent for any of this, right? Like where you have, I mean, so far Democrats have kept winning, but the whole system that they have to just keep winning in order for American democracy to keep going is insane, right? At some point they're going to lose and the system dies. I mean, it just is so scary. And so I would say, I think there's, so, you know, a lot of us who are, you know, I'm 45. So like, I remember I didn't love George W. Bush. I didn't really love Ronald Reagan. I actually haven't loved any Republican president, but there was a sense in which if they lost, they might leave. Whereas that now, who even knows? So I think it's very scary, the idea. And again, the part of the problem with mainstream media is that, and I say this as a member of the mainstream media, is that it's very easy to frame things in a false equivalency. It, there are just tricks, journalistic tricks that we've all been doing for such a long time, and the stakes used to be much lower. Now, unfortunately, you do things like that, and you're normalizing autocracy. Yeah, and I mean, look, I, I, um, I have a lot of respect for Liz Cheney, what she did on the January 6th commission. Yeah. But Liz Cheney is a rock rib ultra conservative. Like no one, mm -hmm. no one would have said that, that Liz Cheney was a moderate anything. I mean, yeah. she is anti-choice. She opposed all the voting rights bills. Like she is a rock ribbed conservative. Yeah. And so to me, it's both a hollowing out of two things. It's ho a hollowing out on the, of the Republican party of people like Liz Cheney who actually have principles and want to govern at all, mm -hmm. but also a hollowing out of what used to be, you know, very common in New York, for example, but not just in New York, um, you know, kind of true moderate Republicans, people who right. had an interest in, you know, finding compromise solutions. And it seems like that part of the Republican Party is just gone. Yeah, I mean, I hate to, I, the one thing I would say is New York, it's, I think of New York as kind of a shit show when it comes to certain democratic norms, I, you know, fair enough. like red from one New Yorker voting. to another. Yes, right, fair enough. exactly. I mean, we've we we haven't like been covering ourselves with glory, and even like we had federal primaries on a different day than state primaries yeah. in order to protect incumbency. So, but yes, we're not as bad as New Jersey. I mean, there are blue states where there's some real fucked up shit going on. As I shouldn't curse, but uh, you okay. know, but. Um, so, so yes, but I do think, look, I mean, we sort of had this third rail, which was we still believe in like free and fair elections. And when you lose, you say you lost and you, you know, and that is now just completely out the window. But yeah. I mean, yeah, I also think like the wor the people who are ultimately the sort of worst are the people who keep it going. I mean, like Mitch McConnell absolutely knows better. Yeah, and he, he just endorsed Trump. And he hates Trump. I mean, it's just like a craven power play. All right. So you mentioned New York. So <laughs> I've been waiting to ask you this question. I've been yes. waiting to ask you this question. So, you know, you grew up in New York. You are a keen observer of New York. <laughs> um, you know, in the 1980s, when Donald Trump was sort of building his public persona, uh, a very, at that time, niche, but very prominent and important social commentary magazine called Spy. Oh, the best. Routinely called him a short-fingered vulgarian. And it, it appeared to many of us that what Donald Trump wanted more than anything else was to be accepted by New York's elite. Yes. Um, and he never, he never got there. And I'm just curious, as someone who grew up in New York and saw this evolution from that to where he is now... Um, what is it that New Yorkers didn't understand about Trump? And what is it that the rest of the country should know that New Yorkers do know about Trump? 
Well, and also, what did we do? Like, we, you know, had we just invited him to a few parties, the man might not be president, have been president. Uh, no, it, I agreed. I mean, you know, again, like, New York is such a weird place because it's not Palm Beach, right? There's not some kind of, <clears throat> I mean, there are people who've been in the city for a long time, but they're not necessarily you know, uh, social register people, right? And I mean, a good example is my family, all, you know, Ukrainian Jews. But uh, who's, uh, so I would say, you know, Trump, the, look, I think that the what happened with Trump was that he was on television, people bought the lie of him as a great businessman, and then he had this magical combination of being famous with no voting record. Mm -hmm. So that was really helped him. So he said, you know, and then he was a little charismatic and he was running against a politician who really was a career politician. And so what I think happened was he said, you know, some people said, well, he's going to be liberal because he used to be a Democrat. And some people said he's going to be concerned. He was like a Rorschach, like he could be anything you wanted. And he was a little funny. And so... He ended up, but what happened was, you, you know, the difference between him and like a Berlusconi or a, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a successful autocrat is that what he should have done, the moment is that he had that speech is he should have been like, I'm going to be the president for all of you and just lied. But what he did do instead was he just went, he just, because he's so undisciplined and he's not, I think he has two big problems. One is he's undisciplined. And one is he's he's ultimately not very smart. So he just said, if I, you know, he knew he had gotten elected on crime and and racism. So he just decided he'd keep going with that. And the problem was he never could grow his electoral base ever. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, most most presidents use their inaugural address to inspire. You know, ask not what you can do for your country, right? right? Uh, 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 I'm sorry, ask not what your country can do for you, ask for what you can do for your country, or or try to project some broader vision. He started with American Carnage, which, yeah. you know, is kind of a downer, you know, like yeah. even if it's true, like really people don't want to talk about American Carnage on the yeah. day that they're celebrating peaceful transfer of power. Uh, do mean, you think that was a choice? And, uh, or do you think I that think was just like the thing that came out of his head? I think Stephen Miller was the smartest person in that whole shop. And so he just manipulated everyone to get all his speeches read. And I think it was like one of the cases where like the one good writer is also a complete lunatic. And so they'd be like, oh, this looks okay. You know, I mean, who even knows if he read it before he did it? I mean, these are not careful people. Like, you know, we keep thinking because we have all these Democrats who are like, careful and measured and worried and like think about obama with the seven uh, uh almonds you know who are controlled <laughs> and then we have these like republicans who are just like ah oh, fuck it you know so i think that was i mean remember when there was this whole scandal where all these republicans were getting these bills from think tanks that they weren't even like reading and they were just putting them on state in this, you know, on the floor in these state legislatures because they were already written. I mean, there's a high level of laziness going on here too, which you so, cannot discount. Yeah. Which is, you know, like I said, I cannot commend people enough to read uh, the piece you wrote about Mike Johnson in the house, because I do think it speaks not just to Mike Johnson in the house, but I think it speaks to, a broader understanding of, like you said, how Republicans govern. Um, yeah. But it does raise the question, and I, you know, people, you hear people ask this, so I'll ask it to you directly, Molly. Well, if that's the case, like we survived Trump once, why will it be so much worse this time? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the important part is like, we barely survived Trump once. Like the whole time when that Mick Mulvaney, uh, piece came out in the wall street journal i was like the the op-ed i was like oh he's not leaving like mick mulvaney had this op-ed in the wall street journal was like don't worry he'll leave peacefully and right. i thought no he's not gonna yeah. like i thought for sure there's no way they're getting like they're gonna have to just like it, and so I think this, I mean, I don't think this, this time, he's not running for four years. He's just running. 
Right. There's no like, you know, like sometimes you'll ask him like, well, you know, that you've heard I've heard mainstream media, mostly Fox when he's interviewed or right wing media. So it's not even really mainstream. Uh, we'll ask him, you know, what he sees his four years to be. And he will basically sort of, you know, deliver some kind of theory of the case, which is, you know, it, it's clear that he's, you know, might try to get another round of, you know, that he didn't get to finish the first. I mean, I just don't think you get rid of him after four years. That's my take. But don't you think that's, I mean, look, we saw Putin do this. And I understand right. the American Constitution and the Russian Constitution are different. But one of the way Putin did it is he just switched positions. Right. Remember, like yeah. people forget, like before Putin right. totally disregarded everything, uh, Putin had this thing where he went from being what prime minister to president or such a thing. Like, like people think this is crazy, but like maybe Don Jr. becomes the nominal president next time. I mean, the fact, even the fact that like they're part, I mean, again, we don't know what happens and like, you know, Hillary lost by Democrats being overconfident, confident. So I'm not even going to touch this, but you definitely see how Trump running this time is so incredibly kind of like, you know, last time he had Ivanka, this time he has Don Jr. Like, that's the <laughs> worst one. You know what I mean? Like, not a great time. That's, the, down Eric's right. wife. that's the time. Right. right. I mean, they put Eric's wife in front of the, in, in charge of the RNC. Like, things are kind of the wheels have kind of come off. When you think about the things that you worry about, I get asked all the time, what are you, Mark, what are you most worried about yeah. for 2024? Like, what are the things you worry most about? You know, I worry about, so I worry about people saying this, what, what's the worst that could happen? That worries me a lot. You know, like how bad could another Trump? That's a thing that, you know, when people say that to me, that gets me pretty worried. Uh, mostly I worry about what happens like, do people get to vote? I mean, the good, the things that make me feel a little better is like Wisconsin has a Democratic governor, mm -hmm. uh, Michigan has a Democratic governor, Pennsylvania has a Democratic governor, Arizona has a Democratic governor. So, like, people will be able to vote. Like, I actually thought before the midterms, I had this whole insane theory that if Carrie Lake won, that would be the end. Like, a Democrat would never win Arizona ever again because she had told us that was how it was going to go. So that made me super anxious. And then, uh, and I was like, we're going to have to get a house somewhere out of the country. Like, that's where I, that's when I really go down the rabbit hole. Over Arizona. Like, right. Arizona, because I thought. Arizona was going to drive you out of the country. Yeah, because I thought, well, it's the, if Arizona, I thought Arizona, Pennsylvania, because that governor was crazy too. Wisconsin, you know, Wisconsin was up. I mean, there were enough governorships up in important states that I thought, I mean, so what makes me anxious is this idea that we're not, that, that you know, part of the country does not believe in democracy anymore. And that makes me super anxious. Yeah. Um, you, you also uh, point out something that I'm very worried about, which is that you can't have a, functioning democracy where only one party can win or else democracy ends, right? Because at that point, it's not really a functioning democracy. Like you have kind of like, you're kind of buying time for democracy. Like sometimes I tell people when they ask me about my litigation, I say, I'm, I'm not actually litigating to save democracy. I'm litigating to buy time for democracy to save itself, right? Because yeah. ultimately the courts are a very imperfect vehicle, uh, to say the least. As we're seeing today. With this As we're seeing, yeah. which I want to ask you about in a second, but but um, the but you know what is this like what like Tim Miller laughed at you when right. you but like what's okay Tim Miller like what's the, so what's the answer? I mean the 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 fantasy that we should not allow ourselves to have is that Republicans lose everything in 2024 and they lose by like Reagan level loss, not Re Reagan right. re-election right where he won where they just get clobbered, where like normal voters say, this is enough. Right. And then if that happens and you, and they lose in like, for example, they lose across the board. So they lose 
for like MAGA candidates like Carrie Lake, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine Carrie Lake wins after all of the craziness and now her pivot to less crazy. I don't think that's a winner for her, but like it, Carrie, like everybody loses from Carrie Lake to um, the guy in Pennsylvania who's been running forever. McCormick. McCormick, to Dave McCormick. So even the people who seem like normal capitalists and not crony capitalists, like all of them lose. Then I think you said, then the Republican party has like a come to Jesus moment. And they're like, well, obviously we can't grow the base with this. And we have to like, re, you know, look at the, you know, the, the solve for Donald Trump electorally is not Ted Cruz. Right. It's not someone less likable and more crazy. And what I actually was worried about in 23 was Ron DeSantis, because Ron DeSantis ran as Donald Trump without the, you know, I mean, he lost, he lost the primary because he ran as Donald Trump without the charisma, but he ran as Donald Trump, but with book banning and all the authoritarian tropes that like, I mean, the stuff that would make Mussolini blush. So Molly, you mentioned, um, uh, what's going on at the Supreme Court. Um, you know, the Supreme Court is considering um, an absolute batshit case out of batshit. Texas uh, involving banning uh, misoprostone, which is a drug that has been approved for forever um, yeah. uh, and is used in um, abortions. Um, uh, but And miscarriages and, and all miscarriages sorts of other... And, and I mean, all other stuff. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. It's insane that the case had to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's just all agree with that. Like, there's yeah. a oh, yeah. whole, we could do a whole episode about why this case is literally a made up case. Um, yeah. That was yep. judge shot, like all of the things. But I'm curious from your standpoint, um, you know, I oftentimes find myself having to be, or not having to be, but I oftentimes find myself as someone who is saying, look, the courts are not great. And the courts right. are making a lot of bad rulings, but we can't give up on them because they also are, you know, I kind of view them the way I view Liz Cheney candidly. Like on the right, one hand, right. she or votes Kinsella. a lot of bad ways, but on the other hand, I kind of need her to do the things that she will, is willing to do. And I'm just curious, am I too optimistic there? I mean, I'm hearing just bits of it because I wasn't able to hear the whole thing. It seems like Alito and Thomas, I mean, Alito and Thomas, it's worth just giving up on, right? right? They become, Fox News has, you know, they're like every grandparent who Fox News has ruined, right? They don't have, you know, they're bringing in stuff from, I mean, they haven't quite yet brought in anything from the Gateway Pundit, but it's coming, right? So that crew, I don't think there's any hope for. My sense is, look, this case, I mean, they don't have stand, I mean, there, there's so many reasons, like, they don't have standing, but there is a sense in which you open the door to the FDA to just revoking FDA approval on drugs you don't like. You know, you don't like a certain drug because what it does, you don't like a, you know, I mean, it, the, the rabbit hole you could go down is insanity. And I think what's interesting, if, if you look at the history of methapristone, it was uh, approved in... Uh, it was, it had been in, you know, it had been approved yeah. in France way before it had been approved in the States. And, and actually the anti-choice uh, activists came after the French doctors. They came after the, you know, they used all of their arsenal to make their FDA approval for this drug uh, much more protracted than it needed to be. And they actually, the company that brought it to the States, I mean, they, they really are, this group really is kind of a group of terrorists, right, when it comes to women's health. And the most interesting thing to me about uh, the overturning of Roe v. Wade is that abortions are up, right? And then pr it has never been more dangerous to be a pregnant woman mm -hmm. in America. Probably, I mean, it was probably more dangerous in 1973 before Roe, but it's, uh, you know, it's very dangerous. I mean, this Lyft Louisiana report that I was talking about from, from last week, I mean, showed doctors refusing to treat until, you know, they're not taking patients until 12 weeks because they don't want to be blamed for miscarriages. And I, so I've been, I'm really shocked at how 
doctors have really fallen into line because they don't want to get fined and they don't want to lose their licenses. And so you're really seeing the, that the that you know women, pregnant women are suffering. Look, I I um, wrote extensively after January sixth that I thought the legal profession had a lot to answer for because ultimately, you know, being a licensed professional means you have a certain obligation to not just your own career, but to the, to the public. When you're a doctor, you're not, you're, you are a physician by, by, by virtue of education for sure, but uh, an obligation you have to your patients. And I, you know, there was an article and I tweeted it a number of years ago um, uh, a study by, and it's always, you have to always be careful about doing historical comparisons. I get that. Um, but how, if you, it was an article about how doctors, lawyers, and accountants in the third Reich, how essentially they fell into line, like all three of these professions that yeah. it had, that it had very <laughs> strong, you know, very strong places in society because mm -hmm. of the, the guild system and the, you know, the, the way German society was, and all of them just fell into line. And I'm not accusing the doctors here or the, M I'm sure the AMA is, you know, uh, but, but it does feel like um, I'm watching a little bit of a parallel with the doctors as I did with the lawyers, which is that a handful of lawyers did some really terrible things. And then a whole bunch of other lawyers were like, yeah, the cases weren't right, but, 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 but rather yeah. than these people don't belong in our profession. Like these are just, these are just people who literally should not enjoy the right to practice law. And where is the medical community? Not just in standing right. up against the case, but just saying like, look, if you are a physician who is using your medical license to, to perpetuate some of these things. You just don't belong to be in the profession. Yeah. No, I mean, and the lawyer stuff, I mean, that I've been shocked at how slow it's been to disbar some of these yeah. lawyers. I mean, shocked. And I mean, I think that's because a lot, I mean, again, this gets back to this idea the guardrails are not holding. Yeah. The guardrails okay. are not holding. In the, in the last couple of minutes I have with you, I just have to ask you, there has also been a significant controversy uh, in the mainstream media. I was shocked um, to see that uh, NBC News hired Ronna McDaniel. Mm -hmm. I was very proud to see how many MSNBC mm -hmm. and NBC, I should say both, yeah. uh, hosts came out and spoke against it. And so, you know, it's easy for you and I to say how terrible Ronna McDaniel is and, and, you know, they shouldn't have done this. I'm actually interested in another thing because you've been a professional journalist. You work in news organizations. What, what do you think was like the internal <laughs> debate? Like, like, how did you, how do, how does an organization go from, she is constantly lying about us. She is constantly lying about the thing that we care most about. Um, right to we're going to hire her to be a paid contributor. I was so blown away by Chuck Todd. I mean, yep. Chuck Todd, my man, the first thing he did, and he stood up for, you know, political director of NBC, stood up for uh, everyone, stood up for um, Kristen Welker. You know, that's a very tough position. Speaking of someone who's been in that position, is a very tough position, so I was really, impressed with that. And then Mika and Joe right away, really so impressed. You know, these are people who are putting their livelihood at risk. I mean, not, you know, or to do what's right. And like, if you think about other news channels where people who are beyond the pale have been added to the roster, I mean, they don't ask you who they're going to hire. You know, they don't ask, you, you know, like contributors or hosts if they're going to hire someone i would say like there was a time when you could hire someone who the problem with Ron, rana is that she is not a normal republican right she is anti-democracy and at no point has she said like she could have gone on meet the press and said we were wrong it's not okay you know, the fake elector scheme, she could have disavowed everything she had done. And then you could have at least said, well, you know, she's come, or, you know, she's 
she's understood what she's done. She's, you know, she's working towards democracy now. She's going to sort of dime out all those people. She's going to testify. But that's not what she did, right? She kept lying about the election. She said, uh, she said, she said things like, well, there were irregularities, which they were not, right? It was a pandemic, right. a global pandemic. The irregularities were global pandemic. You don't want to die when you go vote. That was the irregularity. That's not irregular. That was planned. And uh, I think, look, you know, if you were to like go back in time and look at the moment Republicans really went down this path, it was the moment they figured out that if they made it harder to vote, they had more likelihood to win. Yep. And that was, you know, and it was, and a lot of this is an outcropping of that, right? They said like, let's make it harder to vote. Our people will win that way. And, and again, is comes back to this idea that this is like this last bastion of trying desperately to not have a multiracial democracy, right? We've never yeah. been a multiracial democracy. And I thought there was a really important um, thing that Rana did that literally whitewashed reality. Right. When she was talking about the, the, the folks, the, the two Republicans in Wayne County who were refusing to certify and she was acting like, oh, we just didn't want them to feel pressured. Wayne County covers Detroit, right? She wasn't asking the white counties, the or the, right. not white counties, but the 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 more Trumpian, uh, more suburban rural. And, and rural yeah. counties not to certify. Right. They were asking specifically and making appeals based on Detroit. Right. And so I think it's like, uh, as you say, this was an attempt not just at trying to hold up the election, but trying to disenfranchise not just any voters. But right. but think about it. What was Rudy Giuliani's pitch? Philadelphia. Right. right. right? What exactly. was Ronna McDaniel talking about? Wayne County, Detroit. Right. Yep. Where, you know, yep. we, we so I think that that is a really, really important point. Um, exactly. I do want to also commend, I thought, uh, I thought that of all of, and I watched all of them, I thought that of all of them, uh, Nicole Wallace, I thought, gave yeah. the most powerful. She's gave the most power. Um, well, and because also she tied it because she really tied it from point A to point B to to the challenge of democracy and authoritarianism. Yeah, and also, I mean, that I thought she was super incredible with the um, with just how Timothy Schneider is a genius, yeah. and to bring him in to talk about that, and he has been just so you know, dogged about this American democracy issue. Jesus, so worrying. Well, Molly Jong Fast, you are dogged. You are amazing. <laughs> you are someone who I always read every time you write, wherever you write. I am always watching you on TV, wherever you are now. Well, I you too. Are we going to be on together today? I, you know, I'm, I'm available. <laughs> you just, uh, uh, you probably have more pull than I do. Um, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This was great. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review and find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news by visiting democracydocket.com and subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Gabri Corporal, Ali Rothenberg, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Gabby Corporal and Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.